Um, ended with this on Friday. Is that right? We talk about impulse on Friday? I believe we did. Um, and we talked about the two parts of impulse, the cause and the effect. The cause is applying a force over a period of time. The effect is that it will change something's momentum. I tried to indicate, too, that you needed to be aware that the direction of the force is the direction of the change in momentum. Did I make that conversation, too, and talk about how you needed to be, that it's not necessarily in the direction of the momentum. It's in the direction of the change in momentum. So the example I would have said is that if you had a ball going, like a puck on the ice, going this way for a moment, and then a moment later, the puck is traveling this way. Well, what direction was the force probably acting on the puck? Can you reason out that the only way you could stop the puck from going to the right and now make it going down to the left is if the force was like this way? So remember, this will be the tr direction of the change in momentum because it is the direction of the unbalanced force acting on the object. Impulses are always due to unbalanced forces. Unlike when we talked about with work, where any individual force can do work, impulse causes changes in momentum. And a change in momentum only occurs if there's an unbalanced force. It's just the way the math works. In fact, what I was hoping I would have done on Friday, and I'm not sure if I did or not, is talk to you about this. Did I talk about this much at all? This is the way that you're supposed to learn impulse. This is, and when I say supposed to, what I mean by that is impulse is based on any force, even a force that is not constant. So this would be how you would calculate the impulse for a non-constant force. This doesn't show up that much, but it was on last year's exam. Last year they gave some, something like 3t squared plus 2t was the, the force, and you had to find the integral of it in order to get the change in momentum. And they even presented a graph to go along with this. It was, it was an interesting exam. We're going to come back to this second semester. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it first semester. It's not on your semester exam here, and it won't be on Friday's test. But I do want to talk to you about one thing here. We have the integral on the, the left side, and that tells us the change in momentum. But if we didn't integrate... You could write force as the change in momentum over the change in time or the derivative of the momentum with respect to time. You guys who have, um, have not had calculus don't necessarily understand the implication here, but all of you, I want you to know that this is the original formulation of Newton's second law. Newton's second law was never F equals MA. That's not what he wrote. Um, in his book on physics, Newton starts with this being his, his um, postulate for how physics works. <clears throat> the reason that he started here is twofold. One, momentum is already a vector, and momentum is something an object has. So he made this object forward instead of acceleration forward. MA suggests that there's objects and there's accelerations and they're somehow separate. He made this object forward in that this is what is happening to something. And momentum is some, something that something has. He said that forces change momentums of objects. That's what he was trying to implicate. But also, this works for situations that couldn't be done before. Um, a rocket loses almost 94% of its mass in the first 11 minutes of flight. So if you're firing a rocket into orbit, the mass is never a constant. Newton was aware of that idea that mass doesn't have to necessarily be a constant, that there could be the consumption of mass as part of your, your useful thrust. And that is something he wanted to make available, that you can deal with things whose velocity and mass were changing at the same time. And that's what this can do. This can solve rocket problems that F equals MA can't solve. So. It's important that you, you have an appreciation for this. We're not going to use this very much. But it's, it's important that you have an appreciation. Second semester, we'll talk about the rocket problem as kind of a fun little side thing, just so that you have some information about it. It is part of our curriculum, but has never been asked on the exam. I do also want to talk about this. Last week, we had 
uh, an example question, not last week, two weeks ago, we had an example question in your homework where you were giving a force versus position graph and told about you know, what to, how to deal with that. A force versus time graph is the same kind of thing. You should know that the area in here, this would be the impulse. Oftentimes, impulse graphs look more like this because we tend to look at impulse graphs for collisions, one object colliding with another. And they happen usually over a very short amount of time, and often the force has this kind of profile, that there's no force for a little bit, there's the collision, and then there's no force after the collision because the two objects separate. Often, we get two sets of data. We get the data for, item, for object one, and we get the data for object two at the same time. So we'll have often a graph that looks like this, at the same time as the graph that's there. Where one object is experiencing a positive force and the other object is experiencing a negative force. And this is due to the fact that those two objects collided. And by Newton's third law, those forces have to be equal but opposite. So often they'll be the blue object, that's hard to do, and the yellow object. And they will have equal but opposite impulse but it's still important that you know that the area under the curve is the impulse. And the slope has no meaning at all. Just things I want you to have in your notes. So force versus time graphs, the area under the graph is the impulse. Super common multiple choice questions. Okay. All right. My goal today is to talk to you about collisions and less about impulse. The number one reason we really study momentum is because of collision problems. Collision problems are a study in impulse, but generally we don't use impulse very much after we know we have a collision. So I want to talk to you about what a basic collision is and how do we characterize a collision. Anytime one object comes in contact with another, a collision is occurring. That's the technical definition of a collision. So anytime one object contacts another, we say that's a collision. There are lots of things that happen in collisions, but ultimately, a collision is an experiment in force. If this car strikes the other car, there will be a moment in time when the two cars are in contact. Let's say for argument's sake that this car has zero velocity and this car has some velocity to the right. And we'll say this car has mass one and this car has mass two. Okay. Now, I imagine three states of this problem. State number one is the approach, the moment before the collision occurs. Let me go ahead and just duplicate that again. State number two is going to be the moment that there is contact. Now, generally, contact doesn't last very long. In most collisions, the time of contact is small. Milliseconds, maybe less. We talked about the fact that impulse problems tend to be problems in which the time is small. But then, usually, there's the result of the collision. And likely, in that collision, one object's velocity is going to change due to the collision. So before, during, after. Now, 
we don't necessarily know the result of a collision beforehand. It's hard to predict what happens in collisions. And we'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that in just a minute. But what I want to, to emphasize is that before the collision, each object may or may not have a starting momentum, an initial amount of momentum that describes the motion of the object. This would be, of course, M1 times V. The other car in this particular collision had no momentum prior to the collision. We said it was staying still. So all of the momentum of the system is currently being carried by car one. Now, I want to talk about two different things here. Each car has individual momenta, but also a system can have momentum. So you have to read your problem carefully. If you're being asked for the momentum of an object, you're being asked for the momentum of one thing. But if you're being asked for the momentum of the system, then the momentum of the system has to be the sum of all of the momenta. Now, I'm not going to write this down, but I'm going to say it three times so you have a time to write it down. The momentum of a system is the momentum of the center of mass of the system. The momentum of a system is the momentum of the center of mass of the system. Again, the momentum of a system is the momentum of the center of mass of the system. Now, this picture, I'm not trying to, to, to make this weird, but the center of mass of the system is somewhere right there, wouldn't you agree? Somewhere between the two objects? And the center of mass of the system is moving to the right because this car is moving to the right. And the distance is getting closer together so the center of mass of the system is moving to the right. That's the momentum of the center of mass. Now you understand that I've given you the tools to calculate how to find center of mass. But it's important that you understand that the center of mass of the system is how you can classify the system's momentum. Now, there is the moment of the collision, the moment the two objects are in contact. During the collision, this is the only time that forces are being applied. And it should be clear that this car is experiencing a force in this direction due to the contact of M1. That's the direction of the force on car two. And this car is also experiencing a force in this direction. This is Newton's third law, that car M1 experienced a force to the left. These two forces have to be equal. They have to be because of Newton's third law. And although the time is small, the impulse experienced by this car and the impulse experienced by this car will also have to be equal and opposite. Force times time. The two cars can't be in contact for different times. They have to be in contact for the same amount of time. Right? One car can't be touching the other without the other car touching the first. Does that make sense? Like, if you're touching the tabletop right now, you can't stop touching the table, but the table will still be touching you. You understand that, right? So during a collision, these two objects experience the same force for the same amount of time. Now, I know this, this part's always hard for you guys, so I want to just talk math for just a minute. If this is true, right, which it has to be because of Newton's third law, there's a very important mathematical implication. So I want to just mean for our collision here, it means that after the collision, 
when I add up both of these momentums, it has to equal whatever this car had originally. Collision problems are relatively straightforward. The problem with collision problems is often we don't have enough information in a collision question. But in any collision question, you add up the momentums before the collision, and you set it equal to the momentums after the collision. In any collision question, you add up the momentums before the collision, and you set it equal to the momentums after the collision. There are basically three different kinds of collisions. We're going to do one as practice just to get you guys mathematically into this a little bit. So you'll need a calculator most likely. All right, this is a collision. I have a 500 gram car moving at two meters per second, strikes a 1500 gram car at rest. After the collision, the 500 gram car is traveling at one meter per second. How fast is the 1500 gram car going? All right, not a particularly hard question. This is a clear collision problem. So I'll say it again. 500 gram car traveling two meters per second strikes a 1500 gram car that's at rest after the collision. The 500 gram car is traveling at one meter per second. Um, pay attention a little bit, but also understand that I put everything in grams. You're always safest uh, putting your, your values in kilograms, meters, and seconds. But those of you who are pretty shrewd will probably understand that you could probably leave this one in grams and it'll be just fine. Now, for those of you who aren't particularly shrewd, um, the momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two before has to equal the momentum of object one plus the momentum of object two after. That's what a collision problem is. You set up the before case and the after case and you set them equal to each other. Now, if you're just writing this, this out, not enough. Write off to the side what you have to do to set this problem up. Tell yourself something. So that when you're doing your homework tonight, because you're going to have to start it tonight, you know that, right? Test is Friday. You need to get started on the homework tonight. I gave you like 11 basic problems right out of the book and three FRQ style problems. I'll have the answers posted by the end of the day today, so you can't complain about that either. But you need to get started immediately. Yes? It's not posted. It's locked. I'll unlock it. I'll run right out and do that. But I'm not going to stop teaching to. I know. I'm just okay. I do appreciate the feedback. So, object one, 500, times the speed, two. Object two, 1,500, times speed, zero. Right? I've added up the momentums of object one and object two. That's before the collision. A collision occurs. After the collision, object one, 500, times speed, one. Object two, 1,500, times speed, I don't know. Yeah. Not a whole lot to do here, but you should do it. It's not much. Can you do it? Can you find out how fast object two must be going after the collision? This is what collision problems will be like. Quick, I'm going to pick one of you.
yep. one third meter per second. Do you all see that unless you know one of these velocities afterwards, there's no way to do this problem? Do you guys see it clearly? There's just not enough information. The problem with collision questions is they have to supply you with quite a bit of information for you to have any reasonable way to do it. We don't know what kind of interaction occurred between the two cars, whether one was damaged or not. The thing about a collision is that there has to be a lot of information presented to you for you to be able to successfully predict what happens in a collision. The one thing that will always be true is the momentum before will always be equal to the momentum after. But this is not without energy. Energy is a part of this too. In most collisions, kinetic energy is not conserved. In most collisions, kinetic energy is not conserved. We call these inelastic collisions. Inelastic collisions. These are collisions in which kinetic energy is not conserved. That doesn't mean energy is not conserved. Energy could still, is still conserved. It just probably was transformed into other stuff. There's probably noise. Maybe it dented the cars. Somewhere the energy went. But kinetic energy is not conserved in inelastic collisions. Now, you guys are pretty smart. You understand that the, the prefix in the word inelastic, in, means opposite of elastic. So there are a classification of collisions called elastic collisions. In nature, these are exceedingly rare. They happen generally only at the atomic level, where one nucleus glances off another nucleus. In real life, there aren't really many elastic collisions. There are collisions that approach it, but not really. But you can probably imagine what this is. In an elastic collision, momentum and kinetic energy are conserved. Remember the word conserved means stays the same. Now, I'm only gonna write this out so that you understand what it would mean if we had said the kinetic energy were conserved. Of course, we would have M1, V1, plus M2, V2 would be equal to M1, V1, M2, V2, before and after. That's the momentum part. But if the kinetic energy were also conserved, you'd have one half M1, V1 squared plus one half M2, V2 squared equal to one half M1, V1 squared plus one half M2, V2 squared. If you have an elastic collision, you generate two equations, which means you could predict the answer and not have both velocities. It's harder, right? Because you see there's going to be a lot of substitution, and in many cases, some of that substitution is squared. You're going to produce a quadratic function that you're going to need to solve. They are harder to do. They are mathematically cumbersome and complicated. They are incredibly unlikely be something you would have to do. But I'm just giving out the different types of collisions. There's one more kind of collision, and it's called a perfectly inelastic collision. And there's nothing perfect about it. It's a stupid name, but I didn't make these up. A perfectly inelastic collision, believe it or not, is the most likely question you'll have on the exam. And in a perfectly inelastic collision, one object sticks to another, or two objects that were stuck together separate. We're going to do the former. So let's have our 1500 gram car.
traveling this way at one meter per second. And our 500 gram car traveling this way at four meters per second collide and stick together. What is the velocity and direction of the system after the collision? I think it's to the right. But we'd have to do the math to figure it out for sure. But this is a perfectly inelastic collision. The two objects stick together due to the collision. Um, still, any collision, you're going to use the rules of conservation of momentum to solve. Collision questions are pretty straightforward, but you still have to set them up correctly. I have two objects, and so I'm going to set up the before case and the after case. Folks, what I was hoping to get to in this one isn't just that at the end you're going to have a 500 and 1500 gram car that are stuck together and have the same velocity, right? If they stick together, the implication is that they have the same velocity. But also I wanted to imply something else. The 500 gram car has a velocity of four and the 1500 gram car has a velocity of one. But momentum is a vector. If four is to the right and one is to the left, you had better decide what direction is positive and what direction is negative. So if I make to the right positive, then my one has to be made negative. Right, they, momentum is direction. You set these equal to each other. Go to another screen for this. The impulse is the same but opposite on both cars. Then this is going to be car two. This is car one. Minus the change in momentum of car two has to equal the change in momentum of car one. Right. This is just the implication of saying that one impulse is the opposite of the other. We got that from force and time, but impulse equals change in momentum. So this impulse caused a change in momentum. Now here's where you really have to kind of pay attention. Change in is final minus initial. So P1 final minus P1 initial is what change in momentum means. And for the other car, this is negative P2 final minus P2 initial. Now, do a little math here. I'm going to distribute the negative sign. Distributing a negative sign just flips the two. That okay? Yes, no? Third period always requires a little bit extra. I want to collect the initials on one side and the finals on the other side. So from here, I'll move this to the other side and this to the other side. And I'll get P1 final plus P2 final equals P1 initial plus P2 initial. We all good so far? This is the sum of the momentum final. And this is the sum of the momentum initial. Now, if you don't see the implication, let me spell it out. The momentum of a system doesn't change in a collision.
momentum conservation is the most powerful conservation rule in all of physics. I'm going to say that again. It's more powerful than the conservation of energy. There's lots of different types of energy. Energy can go in lots of different places. It's hard to track down energy. But there's only one kind of momentum. And when we say momentum is conserved, we mean it. That momentum is always conserved in all collisions. The momentum of a system doesn't change during a collision. Individual momentums change, but the momentum of a system does not change. The only way to change the momentum of a system is with a force on the entire system. It's the only way to change the momentum of a system. So inside a system, it could have a collection of a billion particles. So it doesn't matter how many there are. And they can all be colliding all the time. But the momentum of a system never changes, which means the motion of the center of mass of a system never changes. Guys, you're looking for the multiple choice answers. These are the multiple choice answers, right? The kind of stuff you tend to screw up and you get six out of 14 multiple choice questions right because you don't read them carefully. But I'll say it again, the momentum of the center of mass of a system never changes. The only way to change it is through Newton's second law. We tend to think of these as individual objects, but the momentum of a system doesn't change, which means the motion of the center of mass of a system doesn't change. 